Hi everyone. So it should be live now. I actually thought I was live before and I don't think I was. So <laughs> if I'm repeating myself, I don't think I am. Um, I hadn't pressed the button correctly. So uh, we're live. In fact, we're a few minutes behind um, if you're watching me. So there is a slight lag. Keep dropping your hellos in the chat box. I'm going to go through those again because I think you all missed that because I hadn't pressed the button. Silly me. So. Samantha is calling from Edmonton, which is wonderful. Sheila is calling from Dallas, Texas. Lisa from Western Australia. We have one Australian staying up late, I think. It's about 10 or 11 p.m. So it's great to have you here, Lisa. Heading into winter, I know, yeah, it feels like winter here anyway. So we're probably in the same climate, roughly, if you're heading into winter. Um, Becky is calling from Georgia. I know Becky from the Inner Circle and Maggie George, I know as well, who's calling from Asheville, England. She's about to start teaching. Um, because of the scheduling, it's about 2 p.m. here. So the same in um, England and it's probably about teaching time. I'm not teaching until 3.30 today, which is a late start for me. So I was able to squeeze in this workshop. Tanya is calling from tuning in from Charleston, SC, which I think is South Carolina. Someone could correct me if I'm wrong. Nadine is from Montreal, Canada. Rachel is from Wisconsin, USA. On break right now, lucky Rachel. Um, I'm doing summer lessons, so probably a lighter schedule than it is for most people. And camps start in two weeks. So you're probably gearing up for those and planning everything. Sharon is tuning in from Virginia near DC and Jody from Oklahoma so people all over the states looks like this is a good time for the diff time difference between here and the states and Maggie is looking forward to starting summer camps through the month of August yeah nice I have a few workshops this summer no full camps but um workshops which um should be fun I like groups like that they're a lot of work but they are fun um, if you are you haven't said hello yet, please do in the chat box. If you have any tech issues at any stage, please refresh the page. That's always the best bet. Um, and if you need to close and reopen your browser, but you should just get the everything to pop back up by refreshing the page. If you're having serious trouble, you might want to head over to YouTube and look up my channel there using my name, Nicola Canton. Um, because sometimes if there's a glitch, that can help. But it should be fine staying on the website right here. So um, if you don't have any problems, just stick around. Uh, and the live chat, if you're having trouble signing in, it's just any Google account. So if you have an account for YouTube or Gmail or Google Docs or anything like that, you can use that sign in. So most people have that now. If you don't, you can create it, no problem. I'd love to see your name and how you're getting on. We're gonna get started in just a second. I'm uh, punctual to a fault. So I tend to try and force myself to be a little bit late just in case people are still heading over. Um, but we're gonna get started in a second and talk about those technique issues and their solutions. Oh, Lisa is having trouble with the live show dropping out. Sometimes that's just at the very start, Lisa. So if you can hear me right now, maybe I'll write in the chat. Sometimes only happens at the start. Might even out. Um, Let me just go get a link for Lisa and all of you, just in case you need to hop over to YouTube to watch there. Um, 
like I say, shouldn't have to, but sometimes these things happen and sometimes YouTube will play a bit nicer with um, its own website. We'll see. So just going to drop this link in and any of you that need to head over, that's the link for that. Um, Hopefully the chat loads if the video doesn't load so that you can click on that. Right, we're going to get started now. If at any stage you are having tech issues, please let me know just in case it's a global <laughs> um, issue that I'm not aware of. So please write in the chat box. I'll keep looking at that. If I don't respond to you straight away about something, um, it's because there's a slight lag between the video and reality. Okay, so I'm a little bit behind you. So do just wait and I will see your comment and um, reply to you. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen now so that you can see the slides. So it sometimes takes a second to load. We'll just give it a minute to load up and seems to be showing up now. So welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, and I hope you're all ready to get started. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, just check in. Yeah, we have a good few watching now. So that's great. Wonderful. Um, if you're wondering why I've left the bar across the top, it's because YouTube doesn't like me going full screen. So we just leave that there to make YouTube happy. Um, and uh, keep anything nasty from happening or all sorts of glitches for people. So I hope you're ready to get started. It's going to be a really fun presentation today. Um, if you just arrive, keep dropping your location and your highs and hellos and what your summer schedule is looking for like and if you have a break coming up in the uh, chat box because I'd still love to see more of those as people join in. So a little bit about me first. I am a piano teacher in Dublin, Ireland. My name is Nicola Canton, and I'm an author of a book called The Piano Practice Physician's Handbook, um, which you can find on Amazon and everywhere else. And I blog at Colourful Keys with two U's, dot IE. Um, that's where most of you will probably know me from. And I have a Facebook community, the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers Community, um, where we talk about all sorts of things to do with teaching and it's a really fun group so do join if you're not in there already. I wear a lot of different hats um, so you may have seen me in all sorts of places but what ties it all together is that it all is about me being passionate about creative inclusive forward-thinking piano teaching, not getting stuck in the past and opening our students up to all sorts of different um, creative musical pursuits. In today's workshop, we're going to be looking at some different technique teaching strategies at the request of group members on Facebook. The five I've chosen are because they're the most common and the most frustrating for piano teachers. So the first is the round hand shape that we all know so well from having to repeat ourselves about. Um, the wrist movements uh, I had a specific request for that and I was going to think of including it up anyway, so that's great. It um, It's one of the trickiest things to get young students to do is to use their wrists effectively. Firm fingertips, which have frustrated us all from time to time. That's where students are bending back at the top finger joint. Proper piano posture, using your posture, sitting correctly at the piano and having students properly prepared to play and then articulation in particular we're looking at legato because a lot of beginners will have trouble with legato. Um, do drop in the live chat which of those that you're most looking forward to or if you have problems with all of them or one in particular so I can elaborate most on the one that's the most uh, popular with teachers. I'd love to help you out. There is a free printable for one of the teaching strategies at the end, which I will share with you then. 
Uh, it's one in particular that there's a few steps involved and I thought it might be useful if I shared one of the printables from my um, Piano Physician course. So that is included at the end. Please stick around to get that link if you can. If you have questions throughout the presentation, you're welcome to speak up. Please put them in the chat box and I'll keep checking in. I've got two computers set up here. So um, I'm happy to answer questions as I go. If I don't get your question right away, don't worry, I will scroll back through at the end just to make sure I didn't miss any. But um, pop them in there as we go and I'll try to get to them. Sharon Hale, firm fingertips are a real problem. Yeah, I think that's one of the most frustrating for a lot of teachers. It's one that we just feel like banging our head against a wall going, why won't they just do it? So um, I'm happy to cover that for you, Sharon. I'll deal with that in just a sec. Okay, now we know why I'm talking about this today. It's because it was a special request of members. Um, but why is technique such an issue for our students? I think the number one reason is it's not fun. And I'm sorry for saying this, I know some people don't like that word, I happen to love it, but I know some people aren't a big fan of the word fun. Um, but it's not fun, or at least it's not perceived to be that way. And that's all that really matters when it comes to working on something uh, in our music lessons. It often pales in comparison in students' eyes to correct notes and rhythms. And that's part of, partly because of the emphasis we place on such things and possibly their parents do as well, and possibly their book does as well. Which leads me on to technique is not where the emphasis is usually placed um, in most method books. There are several I can think of which do this really well, and this is the focus of the beginning stages, but I think that's the exception, not the rule. Most method books focus on reading number one, rhythm number two, and technique sits in the back seat. At least that's what I've experienced in most method books. You can let me know if you disagree. But um, there are only a few I can think of where technique is their number one priority from the start. Fine motor skills that kids don't need elsewhere. So the thing is, piano is great for developing fine motor skills, but students are not going to come to us with having already developed these, especially at a young age, they're not going to have experienced these elsewhere. The closest thing they might have come across is developing a good pen grip. And that doesn't require nearly as much fine motor coordination and control of the fingers as piano does. And even that particular pen grip it might not be up to where it should be, or they might be too young to have even developed that yet. So um, it's a trickier thing than they're used to doing in terms of using their hands. Parents don't know how to help with this at home. So a parent may know how to read music. Even if they don't know how to read music, it's usually fairly straightforward to follow beginning method books that are designed for kids. They can follow along if they want to, and they can help but they won't know what to do when it comes to technique and it's much trickier to explain to them. So we need them to help at home, but they don't always know how to do it. With each of these um, technique exercises and remedies, you need to rinse and repeat. Don't expect sudden changes. Don't expect magic. I'm not magic. I'm sorry to tell you. Um, you need to rinse and repeat these over and over. That's how technique works. That's how we build up long lasting habits. So do each one together in the lesson first. Experience it together. Don't just explain it or write it down. Do it together in the lesson. Take the time to do that. Have the student explain it back to you. So in their own words, what did you do? What was the method we followed there? How did we fix that problem? And take the time to really listen to them and have them say it in their own words, not just parrot back to you what you said. Then assign this for practice at home. Have them come back the next week to their lesson and revisit it and start the whole process again. It just takes repetition of this process until it becomes an ingrained habit and it really sticks. Tanya and Rachel are also looking 
for collapsing fingers and working for a flexible wrist the most, which is great. So we're going to cover those two in just a second. First up, though, I have the round hand shape. This is almost infamous, right? So the phrase, curve your fingers, you might write in the chat box how many times you would estimate you'd say that per day. Maybe you have a different phrase, but most piano teachers have some variation on this curve your fingers, round hand shape, you know, good piano hands. Whatever it is you say, you probably say it all day. And you probably get sick of it. So this flat fingers is awkward. It leads to clumsy legato. It means they need to move in and out of the black keys because they can't reach everything because their hands aren't, their fingers aren't all the same length as we know the curved shape makes them. And it can also cause the wrist to drop down too low, um, which is another bad side effect of these flat fingers. So how are we gonna solve it? The first way I'm giving you today is um, forming the shape with a ball. So you can use a small ball, um, such as a stress ball, um, anything kind of squidgy I think is nice to use, but really anything that will help them fall from the shape that you think is a good size for them. Have them form a loose hold on this ball. So explain to them they're not supposed to squeeze it and they're not supposed to let it drop. It's somewhere in between the two and help them form it. Use your hands to help them form it. And then bring their hand to the keys and remove the small ball. Tell them to keep this shape. This will take a lot of repetitions until they can feel it without tensing up or trying to go into some kind of claw um, as they attempt to make that shape. So keep encouraging them to hold it loosely. An analogy I really love is from Irina Gorin's um, Tales of a Musical Journey. She talks about the orchard and the apple. So students are holding the apple in their hands and if they squeeze it, all the juice is going to pour out. But if they hold it too loose, it's going to drop, right? So they need that in-between um, shape and that loose grip on the ball. Loan out this ball and assign this as homework. So it's very simple. They just go to the piano, hold their ball, try to form that loose shape, don't squeeze the apple, and then bring their hand to the keys. Yes, their hand will not stay like that in the beginning, but doing the exercise and more importantly, putting the focus on this technique will really help in the long term. The spider's house is my second um, solution for the round hand shape. This will help your student form a good hand shape. So you, sorry, you help your student form a good hand shape first. I like to do this on a hard surface, such as the closed piano lid, something like that. And um, you explain that an imaginary spider is crawling inside that hand shape. So they have to keep that spider safe. I like to put my finger underneath their hand so that they can see what it, where the spider is going. They need to keep the spider safe and they can't let their his house fall down. This gives you a really fun way to correct them as they're playing. So instead of saying round hand or curve your fingers, you say, oh my gosh, the poor spider. Let's make that hand shape nice and round and start that again so that we keep the spider safe in his little house. I think you'll agree that that's a really fun way to talk about it and it takes the pressure off the student and stops it feeling like a criticism, keeps an element of fun in it. The third solution I have for this are the hand push-ups. This is more to create an awareness of what that shape is. That might seem obvious to us, but kids don't really feel the difference between their fingers being flat necessarily and their fingers having a round shape. They're just not that in control of their hands. They're not that familiar with them. So place the hands on a flat surface and show them how to do a hand push-up. Now this isn't a fast mood move and it's not about exercising the hands, obviously. It's just about forming the shape. So you drop the hand flat, you lift it up. Drop the hand flat, you lift it up into the round shape. Do this, say, five times and assign this as a warm-up exercise. They'll understand this and parents will too because it's like warming up before a game of football or whatever. You know, it's your warm-ups, it's your little hand exercises before you start playing. And it'll help them to learn how it feels to have a round hand shape. 
Um, you can assign a certain number of these piano push-ups before each practice session. So they're fun, they have a sense of whimsy about them, and it means there's a little bit of technique, even from the beginning, included at the very start. Those were our three about the round hand shape. You might let me know what your favourite was of those three and which one you think you're going to use straight away. But I will move on to wrist movement while you write those in. So wrist movements. We've had a couple of requests for this specifically. So what is the problem? Wrists are often too low down. They're too stiff. Or students are trying to play only from the fingers, so they're not moving their wrist at all. They're completely static in their wrists and their arms maybe too. And they're not shaping phrases and slurs. So this is the main thing that's really hard to teach in the beginning is that wrist roll off. Becky likes the spider's house. Isn't it fun? It's super. So we need to get them to roll off these notes and stop restricting their hand movement by having their wrist in the wrong position. The first solution I have to this is for dealing with the wrists being too low in the first place, because you can't do the roll off if the wrist is in the wrong place. At least it's very hard to. So I described the river of doom running along the bottom of the keys. This is actually one of the um, uh, solutions that I list in my book and in the course as well. So it's borrowed from there. The River of Doom runs along the bottom of the key. So you describe it and indicate where it is, which should be at the level that you don't want your student's wrist to go below. Okay. Hold a ruler or your arm or whatever is comfortable for you to hold there at this level where the river would, river would be. Obviously a blue ru ru uh, ruler works really well because it's like the river, right? And then ask them to start playing. And every time they fall into this river, i.e. they touch their wrist off the ruler, they have to restart their piece. Simple as that. And it certainly is a river of doom because they're going to drop into that and restart their piece only a few times and then they're going to learn that lesson pretty fast. Um, so they should imagine this river at home too. Encourage them by drawing a picture of a river up the top of their piece or writing a on a post-it note or something like that. Um, and even if you have a very enthusiastic piano parent, you could get them to hold up the River of Doom too at home. But this should help with those students who, some students will literally put their wrists onto the ledge below the keys. Do you have any students that do this? Oh my gosh, drove me crazy. Like it just looks like the laziest thing in the world. And how are you gonna play like that? But they do it. Kids are crazy sometimes. Anyway, let me know if you have any students who have ever done that or if that's unique to me, having them down that low. Okay, solution number two. So this is getting into that wrist lift, lift off. I would to say, wrist lift off. Um, what we do for this is we hold our hands on the keys in position, not playing yet. So tell your student to get ready as if they're about to play, but don't play their piece. And then you mime tying an imaginary string around each wrist and attaching it to a balloon. Tell them about the balloon it's attached to and tell them that you're pumping up the balloon with helium so it's getting more and more full and slowly lift their wrist off the keys so that they can feel what that feels like. The balloon is pulling them up into the sky as it gets more full then have them do this mime on their own. You mind pumping it in and uh, they slowly lift their wrist up as it gets more and more full. The handy thing about this one, apart from the beautiful imagery and the smoothness that it um, fosters, is that you can reinforce this later with just a mime. So if they remember it well, and they're playing and they're not doing their wrist roll offs, say, stop, hold it right there for a second. And you just mind tying a string around their wrists and look at them. If they still look puzzled, you might mind pumping up that balloon or blowing air into it. And then you may have to explain it the first few times, but it's super fun because sometimes they'll just collapse in giggles because they see me starting to tie the, uh, the string around their wrist, the imaginary string, and they know what it is straight away um, and immediately go back to the start and do it properly. 
rolling off with the wrist at the end of their phrases or slurs. Um, Sharon says she has a couple of students that have the lazy wrist. I'm glad I'm not alone, Sharon, because um, they used to drive me crazy before I started solving them in this way. Sheila, I love the river of doom going to implement this today. I'm glad you like it, Sheila. It's super fun. We have a lot of fun with that in my studio. Okay, solution number three. This is also for the wrist roll off because I'm pretty aware that that's the number one, at least I'm pretty sure, that's the number one that wrist problem that students will have so much trouble with in the beginning. So, coin rolls. Now, nota bene. This is not the trick of keeping the coin on the back of your hand while playing the whole time. Um, I am not advocating that. That's not my style. And I don't tune out just because you think that's what I'm doing. I'm not doing that, okay? <laughs> what I want you to do is place the coin on the back of their hand or wrist, like you would for that exercise, but then ask them to slowly slide it off their hand by lifting their wrist up. Now they need to make it slide as slowly as possible, which is, you know, it's impossible. At some point it reaches a breaking point and it drops up, but it gets them to focus on moving their wrist smoothly and slowly up once you describe that slow roll of the coin off their hand. It also helps them to feel it moving slightly up and forward, which is really what we want. I find students sometimes get confused by up or forward. Um, Either or, depending on the student, but really it's both together. When I explain it as just up, they tend to do all sorts of nonsense. So I've started saying roll forward with the wrist sometimes, and I think that helps. And this coin idea reinforces that. They can of course do this before their practice at home as well. Okay, on to our third technique issue now. Uh, keep letting me know if you have any questions about any of those as we go. I'm happy to go back a little bit or answer any questions. This one is about firm fingertips. So we've had a couple of people say this is their number one problem. I'm happy to help you out with this. What is the problem? I think you're familiar with it. In my book, it's called the floppy finger predicament. And it is a predicament. It's very annoying. <laughs> the top finger joint bends backwards. Usually students are pushing from their finger instead of using their whole arm to press the key then. And we need to get them to feel the arm as one connected moving unit in order to fix it. So this tends to happen the most in students with long slender fingers and uh, because they have the least control over that top joint in that case. Solution number one is the bionic pianist, which if you've watched one of my previous workshops, I can't remember which one, I did recommend this then as well. It's very useful. And this is not just useful, but super fun too. Um, and this is the one that I'm gonna give you in the download at the end, all the steps for. So don't worry too much about following all these steps or writing them down or something as we go, because that would be kind of hard and you might not be able to listen to me at the same time. So that's why I have that PDF at the, at the end for you. So hold on for that. So to do this, we ask our student to play with an eraser tip pencil. What I mean by that is they should hold the pencil in their hand and with the eraser down towards the keys and they can play one of their pieces or a little bit of their pieces, a little excerpt with the right hand, just with this eraser and then switch to the left hand and then try hands together. That's where the fun really starts. Super, um, super enjoyable. Lots of giggles to be had at that one. Once they've got the hang of this and they're moving their arm around to play, you can then transfer over to a braced uh, finger shape. So put the thumb in behind the top finger joint. Help them to form this shape at first. They won't get it straight away. And if you've used a series like My First Piano Adventures, they talk about a donut. I don't find that very useful. Well, that is, I don't know whether this is what they mean or whether they actually mean a round shape. I guess they do actually mean a round shape. So that's why I avoid that imagery because I don't want it to be completely round. I want the thumb to go in behind that joint and supporting it. 
Um, so not joined at the tip, but in behind, as you see in the illustration there. It's much more useful that way because they can feel that joint and they get the feeling of it being isolated from the rest of their finger, which is so important because they're still developing their dexterity and getting a sense of their own hands, you know. So we form this braced hand shape. Usually finger two is most comfortable to start and do the same thing. Play the right hand, then the left hand, then hands together. And then start to mix up which finger you're using. So you can even use finger four from the right hand plus finger two from the left hand. Start mixing it up and putting that thumb behind different fingers so they get a sense of those joints. Once you've had a good experiment with this, go back to playing regularly and encourage them to feel it as if the thumb is still behind and supporting each of those fingers. It should just help them to have a sense of where that joint is in their sort of uh, feeling of their hand, in their awareness. Anytime they, their fingers are collapsing, take that finger, put the thumb back behind it, play a few notes like that to feel it out and encourage them to practice using these three steps at home. They might be very glad to do it, you know, it's a lot more interesting than playing your piece from start to finish for 20 minutes or whatever it is their parents have them do. <laughs> um, this is a lot more fun. So uh, stay tuned for the PDF with all those steps at the end. Next solution I have for you is the tapping drills. So we do these before playing each piece. So during the lesson, this will happen several times. We close the piano lid put the music in front of them and tap out their piece on the surface as if they're playing it. So with the correct fingers moving around, doing hands together if they can, hands alone if they need to, um, and tap it along with them. Your fingers will probably sound a lot louder than theirs and that's because your <laughs> fingertips are firm. So explain to them the difference and encourage them to tap with this pad of their finger and not let their fingers collapse so that they can make that nice tapping sound too. Uh, when their fingers collapse later, i.e. when you're playing their piece again and if their fingers start collapsing, what we do is we take our hand off the piano, we say stop, let's just check that finger, let's tap that out to check it. And we take it to the full board and just tap it on the full board, whatever finger was collapsing, whatever the offending finger is. So say it was finger three. Let's take that finger three to the full board. Tap, tap, tap. Okay, is it firm again? Okay, grand. Let's keep going. And so on and so, so forth. Obviously, they can do these tapping drills at home as well. Get the parents involved so that they're following these practice steps at home. And absolutely, so important, repeat at the next lesson. On to proper piano posture. Let me know if you have any questions about those firm fingertip solutions as I go into piano posture. Happy to answer as we go. What is the problem? The posture is the foundation of all other movement at the piano. So when they're not set up properly on the bench and at the right height and all that stuff, they're going to be wriggling off the bench and scooching all around and sitting up and, you know, rounding their shoulders and all this nonsense. And it's not going to make for good piano playing. We want them to be sitting up and supported. And we want this at home as well as the studio. That's the key here. It's pretty easy for us to sit them up and set them up properly and put the footstool in and everything during the lesson. But this often isn't happening at home. So that's the key thing I'm going to try and solve in the first solution here, which is say cheese. At the very first lesson, or, you know, your first lesson after watching this workshop, if you had the student a while, no problem. Set them up properly at the piano. Help them set up, sit correctly, you know, put the footstool in the right place, raise the bench to the right height, all that good stuff, and take a photo from the side. Then print this out or send it to their mum or dad to print out or whatever system you have. And then ask them to take a photo at home with their same setup. They're supposed to copy this setup at home and send the photo back to you. Stick both of these photos into their folder or their book or their notebook or anywhere where they're going to see it regularly. That's the key. It's not about 
having it for reference, it's about them constantly coming across this again and again and again, because otherwise they're just not going to look at it, right? We know that very well. So stick both of these photos in side by side, make any corrections you need to to their home setup before you do this. This can be very revealing. You might discover that someone said they had a fully weighted digital piano and they have a toy keyboard sitting on a table. So if that's the case, sort it out <laughs> before you stick the photo in. But assuming they do have a good setup at home, you may just need to say, oh, well, that actually is a little bit low for the bench. So let's fix that this week and take another photo for me. Once you have the perfect setup, stick them both into that folder or the book or onto their face if you need to, so they really see it. Then during lessons, whenever their posture is lacking, whenever it starts to get a bit mm, during one of their pieces, try to take a candid photo without them seeing you, right? So be a bit sneaky, I'd say is the best way. Try to take a photo, not super sneaky, you know what I mean? Um, Try to take a photo while they're playing their piece and they're not looking so hot with their posture. And then when they're finished, take out that photo that you have glued into their assignment book or wherever you put it and compare it to this current photo and say, what is the difference here? What's wrong with this one? This is a great way to do it. And um, it'll give them that comparison and allow them to self-analyze, which they need to do at home anyway. So it's good practice for that. Um, the photo you see here, I'm not saying this is the perfect piano posture, so don't tune out because you're like, what is this woman on about? That child is too high or too low or whatever you're thinking, or that keyboard is not good enough. I get it, right? This is one of my wiggliest students. You have no idea. No one has given told me about any ADD diagnosis, but seriously, he falls off his chair about six to ten times every single lesson. And when he's not falling off his chair, he um, is moving the footstool around with his feet, like picking it up and sort of throwing it around the place. He's he's crazy. He doesn't mean to do it. Um, so like I try not to get mad at him for it, obviously. Um, we're, um, we're working on fixing the um, issue, but uh, he is the wiggliest boy I have ever met, literally. Um, Clara, that's a good idea. Students will enjoy to see themselves Yes, other than correct piano posture pictures in books. It means a lot more when it's really them. And they can see it in their home setup as it actually is, right? Taking a photo is a good idea. Thank you, Shane. So next solution for this one is Steve the Stickler. Meet Steve. Steve in my studio is this little, uh, he's actually a miniature beanie baby. Uh, that I had when I was a kid. So <laughs> I've had him a long time. I used him to be called Steve the Stickler. I have no idea what I called him as a kid, but that's what he's called now. He's a stickler for good posture and technique. So you can pick out any toy to use like this, give him a fun name, and try to introduce him at the first lesson. He's the one to explain posture. He sits on the shoulder and he says, this is how we do this, this is where we hold our arms, this is how we do that. And then Steve sits on top of the piano and he watches you. And anytime the posture isn't looking so good, it's not you that corrects your student, it's Steve. That's Steve's job. And it does just make it a lot more fun, a lot less um, pressurized for your student. They don't feel like they've made a mistake. It's just like, oh, that's Steve's coming out. It's like this funny event. It's not like this boring thing that we have to go through talking about posture and technique. So Steve comes out and he looks cross. And you say, oh, I don't know what's wrong with Steve. What do you think? And they say, I don't know. I think I'm sitting fine. And then Steve goes up and sits on their head. And they say, and we say, why is Steve sitting on your head? Hmm, and because their head is leaning forward or whatever right? Steve can pick out these things. And it's like a little dialogue you have with your student about what Steve is thinking. So pick out a toy that you can use in this way. It's, um, it's so much more fun. And it gives them that constant reminder seeing Steve in your studio as well. 
if you have a student who's really struggling with technique or posture, you might even lend out Steve or another furry friend to help them with technique at home and have him sit on their piano at home uh, for the week to focus on posture. Uh, Tina says, I appreciate the claps, fingertips, exercise techniques. Great, Tina, I'm glad you enjoyed them. So I'm moving into legato now. Um, let me know if you have any questions about Steve or about our pictures of the posture as I go. What's the problem? Understanding legato sound, some students get this instantly and instinctively, but some don't. So that might be the problem. They might be overlapping the notes. So you're hearing C and D together in their scale rather than just one at a time. The notes aren't fully connected. So there's those little, I call them little breaths between the fingers playing that they're not hearing or perceiving. Or they might be tensing their hands right up or collapsing their fingers once they try to play legato. So legato is one of the trickiest things to get as a beginner. and it takes a little bit of a teething process, but the first comment I want to make to you is, is it too early? Now, maybe it isn't, but here's the thing. I think a lot of us, myself included until recently, introduced legato way too soon. I tend to now agree with um, Piano Safari and Tales of a Musical Journey. That's Catherine, Julie, and um, Irene Gurren their methods. They teach non-legato first and they have research to back them up and I happen to think they're right. I think most of us introduce legato too soon and I think a lot of method books encourage us to do so. So I want to encourage you to take a step back and see if you can teach non-legato for a good first few months or a good beginning chunk until your student is really really ready for legato. Um, in Piano Safari, I believe it's the first three units, which would take quite a while in their books. And in Tales of a Musical Journey, it's actually the full first book. So I think that would be about six months to a year of studies before even touching legato. This way, students learn to use their arm weight and engage with all their muscles and really connect to all of that. Um, and they develop their firm fingertips and they find their hand shape without tension. So they get that opportunity and then legato comes later. No problem, we've got time. So you may disagree with me, but I want to encourage you to give it a shot, at least with one student, because I've really seen a massive difference with delaying legato a bit longer and doing that in all my demonstrations. So I never play pieces for them in legato. So they're not imitating me in that way. I I've trained myself to properly use non-legato with a little arm bounce so that they can really explore their technique in that way first. Now, if your student is not understanding legato and you think they are ready for it, there's a few different analogies that I really like. The first is um, to joint or cursive, I believe it's called in the US, handwriting. So joined up handwriting. Second is having sticky fingers. So imagine your fingers uh, just touched a suite and then they're playing the piano. They would kind of stick to the keys. Or it's like a balance beam or tightrope walking where your foot has to go one after the other really smoothly to stay upright. Or it's like singing with small breaths between the notes and without. So you can do that together, do some singing legato and non-legato so that they can feel the difference. But the thing is, student analogies are often the best. So first of all, play both for them and say, what does the second one sound like to you? How would you describe the difference between those? You'll be surprised what they come up with. Now, like the joint handwriting, um, that may be said elsewhere. I, I doubt I'm the only one to say it. But the thing is, I didn't come up with that. A student did. Right? Students have the best ideas. Genius. And it's also like, in, at least in this country, um, that's something that's saved for when they're in second or third class. It's kind of a rite of passage. They have to earn play, um, playing legato. No, joining up their handwriting. So they write in print until they're ready. And their teacher says, okay, you can start writing joined up now. 
So it's a good analogy because it really works on multiple levels, at least in this country. Uh, just checking in with the comments. Rachel, Faber Piano Adventures waits and with Legato until later too. Uh, love the suggestion to model long Legato. Never thought of that. Uh, yeah, well, um, that actually was Tim Toppin said he'd been noticing himself playing Legato even when he was telling students not to. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm doing that too. And I found I was a little bit. So I um, can't remember where he said that. I just noticed him saying it and went, oh, right, I should pay attention to that too. So I'm not alone, Tina. I encourage you to do that um, too. Put in that arm bounce yourself so that you're demonstrating exactly what you want them to play. Um, it makes so much sense to teach non-legato playing first. You can focus on finger strength, posture. Thanks for confirming my beliefs. Yeah, I think we're all gradually moving this way. And to go back to Rachel's comment, Piano Adventures does kind of do that, yes. Um, they certainly don't say teach legato now, but, and maybe I'm wrong because maybe I'm not using the technique or wasn't when I was using the series using the technique book or something, but I don't remember them specifically telling you to play non-legato. I remember them sort of just ignoring it, like whatever you were doing. Um, and maybe that's okay. Like the student does whatever they naturally do and that's fine, but I think it's valuable to specifically ask for non-legato and put that arm bounce in, which is probably what you're doing yourself, Rachel. I just didn't realize until I stopped using Piano Adventures to do that. So I think you'll have seen from the way I treated each of these technique issues, how I think about teaching and how I think about teaching strategies. They all have a sense of fun about them and they're all, yeah, they're all fun to do in lessons, right? So I always inject this sense of whimsy and this imagination that helps things come to life for students and makes these kind of boring corrections really fun. So I wanna encourage you to consider solving more of these piano issues without the headaches. If you'd like to do that, you can join me in my course, which is the Piano Practice Physicians Clinic. Why do I talk about the Piano Practice Physicians Clinic? Why is it a clinic? Well, the thing is, it encourages you to be analytic and thoughtful. That's the main reason, is it keeps you focused on the cure. So it's not about, oh, my student is not doing X, Y, Z, right? It's about, how can I fix this problem? What can I proactively do? okay, look it up in the library and find a solution. And then you try it and you work on it together and it's engaging and it's interesting and it stops you just sort of lamenting about things and stressing and fretting. And it stops your student doing that too because you're not just nagging them to fix it, you're making it into a game. It also takes the focus away from more practice and puts it on better practice which is so important. The more overscheduled our students get, the better we need to make use of the practice time they do have, right? We need to, them to be efficient. And with these strategies, they will be. They will be so much more efficient. It makes such a difference when you start implementing these things. The clinic also creates more job satisfaction and fun for you as a teacher, which is my number one priority. I want this to be fun. I want you to stop banging your head against a tree going, uh, why won't they, whatever they're not doing. It's more fun. You'll see the way I treat things uh, through the presentation today. It's all about finding these analogies and stories and gamified learning and all that stuff, which makes it fun for you as a teacher, which makes it fun for your students too. Because if you're having more fun, so are they. That's the way it works. How is the course structured? Just briefly, it's split up into six parts. Each part is a different type of piano student ailment. So there are different problems you might be having with your students or with their practice time. The first is chronic ailments. So these are bad practice habits. For example, there's start again syndrome where they're going back to the beginning every single time or backtracking those stops and starts and going back over notes, those kind of things. Then we have fevers and chills. These are problems with tempo, then playing too fast, too slow, slowing up, slowing up, speeding down, all those kind of things. Um, then part three, we have heart palpitations. These are rhythm problems. So 
a lot of students struggle with rhythm and there's several different areas that they could be struggling in. So I help you break that down and understand what the root cause is so that you can fix it. And then of course there are strategies to fix it too. In part four, I deal with vision impairment. This is basically all the stuff that students might not be paying attention to that they should be, right? So inattention to dynamics or different notations or missing accidentals, those kind of things. That's what's in vision impairment. Ear infections are the musical insensitivities and aural struggles. So for example, fortissimo fixation is when students are just playing loud all the time because they don't see what's wrong with that. Or some students play way too soft. Or maybe they just aren't expressing emotion in their playing. That's what I deal with there. And then aches and pains are the kind of stuff we talked about today. So technique issues, there's more of that in there and I give you solutions for each one, just like the solutions you saw today, but different ones. The course is split up into 98 videos, which sounds crazy. Why did I do that? That sounds insane. Okay, there's a reason I did it in 98 videos. It's because they're all little bite-sized videos. And there's a reason I did lots of tiny videos instead of a few big ones. It's because I want you to be able to jump into the library and go, this student that's coming today just will not keep their wrists up above the height of the keys or whatever you want to solve, right? And then you jump straight to that uh, cure and you watch it. And it takes you five minutes. You can have your coffee and watch it. You can watch the description and two cures within most of the time, seven minutes, right? So perfect for a coffee, coffee break and then you're ready for the day and you get to take action on that straight away and not get bogged down in a huge giant video of me explaining a bunch of things that are very useful but not for you right now. They're not about the student you have sitting in front of you today at 3 p.m. So that's why I split it up like that. It also, um, you can also follow it the whole way through. There's nothing stopping you doing that. So it means it suits both types of people, both people who want to jump to the one they know they need and people who want to walk through the whole thing so they get a comprehensive overview. And um, there's a workbook to help you take action, to help you take notes, write down which students you think this might be suited to, how you're gonna do it, what your plan is, what questions you want to ask me about. And that brings me to my last point. There is a forum where you can ask questions and get answers about anything you see in the video. And I'm also probably going to add a Facebook community too soon because uh, that's been requested by some of the members of the course. And I always aim to please, so I'm happy to do that if enough members want it. So that'll probably be there too very soon. Um, you can go back and forth, of course, and watch any of the videos multiple times um, and use it whatever way you see fit. But that's why I split it up into all those videos. Um, I hope you'll see the usefulness of that. So the course is normally $97, which is less than a dollar a video. So I think that's quite fair. Um, but I am offering you a special discount for being live on the workshop today. There is a $30 discount that you can get for the next 48 hours. That's more than 30%. So you can get it for $67 if you use the coupon code HEADDESK. Make sure to enter that within the next 48 hours because I'm not lenient with my codes. Um, I like following rules myself, so I like it when rules are um, what they say they're going to be. I like consistency. So it will be turned off. You need to take a look and see if it's right for you in the next 48 hours and then um, the coupon code will be gone. But please do use it if you want to within the next 48 hours for that $30 discount. The other bonus of acting very quickly is that the first five people will get a free copy of my handbook. So that's normally, what is it like in dollars, $12.95? Yeah, I think it's 11.95 euros, so 12.95 dollars. Not sure on the currency conver conversion, but it's around that, right? So I'm going to send it to you. So that's not even including postage. So plus postage, I'm going to send it to you completely free if you buy, if you're one of the first five to buy with that coupon. 
So you can go ahead and do that right now if you want at pianophysician.com slash course. There's tons of info there. If you're currently on the workshop, um, workshop page on my website, you'll see up the top, there's a button that says course. So you can head on over that now um, or after you get off this video and uh, You'll see all the details there. I even give you a little tour inside so you can see a preview of what it looks like inside. You'll know exactly what you're getting because I think that's only fair. Um, and you can buy there. So the first five will get that free handbook and the coupon code is for 48 hours. Now, if you want that freebie with the Bionic Pianist, all you need to do is go to pianophysician.com slash bionic and you can start having fun with that technique. Um, and following those steps because it's just a little bit easier with those illustrations um, and yeah I want it to be easy for you to follow in lessons and not feel like you're trying to remember what the next step was what did she say about that and that so I thought that would be the best one to give you for free that's uh, from the inside of the course and you can have it for free today just go to pianophysician.com slash bionic to download it now, if you have any questions, I've seen some comments coming in there. I'm going to answer them right now. But if you have any more questions, please do ask them in the chat box. Um, and I'll stick around a few for a few minutes to answer those. So please speak up. There's all the info again. I'll leave that on the screen so you can take it down or write down or whatever you need to do um, while it's up there. OK, let's jump back into the live chat. Right, Clara, I tried to make legato at, at the very beginning, I think she means, and ask students, have you tried finger seesaw before? Yeah, I think that's interesting. Seesaw is actually, well, she calls it teeter-totter, but Irina Gorin, that's what she, how she introduces legato in book two. Um, and that works really well. She starts with two nut slurs, I think, or maybe three. Don't hold me to that. Um, but yeah, I think that's great if they can do it without tension. I just prefer to wait because I think you can explore so much more, but absolutely, each to their own. If it works, do it. If they're getting all tense, no, back off. Let's go back to bouncing the notes. F-E, don't know the name there. Um, what series, if any, do you use with beginners? I use several. <laughs> so if we're talking about, uh, I teach from three. So if they're three or a young four, I'd be looking mostly at wonder keys, possibly including some road trip from Piano Ponto as well. If we're looking at four, an old four-year-old, I don't mean actually in months, I mean in uh, maternity, or a five-year-old, maybe a six-year-old. Uh, yeah, I'd be looking at road trip in conjunction with the beginning of Piano Safari, gradually moving into Piano Safari. I include Road Trip to slow down the beginning, just if I need to, and to have some fun in the first few lessons while I start to place them in a method, see what's a good fit. If we're looking at maybe nine or 10 year olds and older, I would be starting them in Piano Pronto Prelude. You may be wondering why if I like Piano Pronto, I don't use that with younger kids. I am not such a fan of keyboard kickoff. I know loads of people love it and I see the value. It's not my style. It doesn't fit with me that well. Piano Pronto Prelude though, I love. So I go from there and they fly through and they get straight into movement one very quickly if they're an older beginner. Hope that helps you. Uh, Rachel, do you explain like today, model, demonstrate or a combination of the two? Rachel, I mostly am at the piano demonstrating. So I explain the issues talking to the camera and sort of gesturing. Um, I talk with my hands quite a bit. And then um, I explain the actual t uh, strategies at the piano, which I think teachers find very useful. So I can demonstrate, I can point at stuff. Occasionally there'll be like an overhead view where I'm showing you something specific. Um, if it's on a tabletop kind of thing, if that makes sense. So. That's mostly what I do. What I do at the very start in the intro and the outro, as it were, the uh, conclusion sort of video, those are like PowerPoints like this one where I'm talking and you see my screen. But most of the time I'm at the piano demonstrating 
and filling in the sheets that are downloadables and stuff like that so you can really see what's going on. Hope that helps answer your question, Rachel. Let me know if you have any more. And let me see. Gru, okay, I can't pronounce that name. I think it's a username, not a name. I'm not sure though. Um, I put the handbook first, LOL, last week. One last person to race to get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I realize some of you will already have the handbook if you've been following me for a while. You're welcome to still um, get it. It's one of the first five. I'll still send it to you. You can give it to a piano teaching friend if you like, or you can uh, nominate to not get it. It's completely up to you. So don't hesitate just because you feel like you don't want to be one of the first five. We'll sort it out and I'll um, transfer that to someone else. Or you could even give me a friend's address if they don't live near you. I'd be happy to send it to them. Tanya. I just purchased the handbook earlier this week. <laughs> Thanks, Tanya, for purchasing it. I really appreciate it anyway. Um, and yeah, that, occurred, that just occurred to me. If you have the Kindle copy, um, I'll still send you a hard copy. That's cool. And it's you know great to have to write in if you happen to purchase the Kindle copy first. Um, Tanya should be getting it in the mail today. Oh, that's so cool. I'm so excited too. I'd love to see a photo of you with it when you get it and let me know how you get on with it. I really hope you enjoy it. I've been getting some great feedback, which I love. Um, it's so great to hear from teachers that are using the strategies so far because it's been out for a few months now and hearing that they're, you know, putting the river of doom into their studio or whatever they're doing. It's so much fun. I love it. Um, Sharon, thank you so much. Got some really good stuff out of today. I'm really happy to hear that, Sharon. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Tanya, how long is the course good for? Will it always be available once purchased or is it available for a limited time? Okay, I have it set up for a year. Now, I've done this mostly so that I can keep updating it and doing all that stuff. But if it gets to the end of the year and you're like, I really want to extend this and just have those videos available for longer if you get I will absolutely extend it we'll just do a really cheap extension price is what I'm thinking so I'm sort of quite flexible when it comes to teachers because I want to do it in a way that suits you so if you find that um a year is not enough when it gets to the end of the year like I say we'll do an extension so don't be worried about that um Oh, <laughs> um, someone has just tuned in. I think that is, anyway, can't, I can't remember who has that username, but one of my students just tuned in. So that's what that comment is. Hi. And, um, Gribbles. I just registered. So great. I'll be in um, touch with you directly after I get off this video. Okay. That's great to hear. Maggie, I've signed up for your clinic. I hope I was one of the first five to get the freebie. I hope you were too, Maggie. It would be great to send it to you. Um, and it'd be getting to you quickly, right? Because you're in the UK. So that'd be super quick hop over the Irish Sea for the little book. Um, so hopefully you're one of the first five. Okay, I'm going to stick around for a few more minutes. So if you have more questions, please um, write them in the chat. Uh, I will have to go in about 10 minutes or so, because I need to get ready for teaching. So um, do let me know if you have more questions. See how, oh, great to see you here. She's already bought the course. Yes, I know you're inside. I really hope you're enjoying it, CEO. Thanks for today's webinar. You're so welcome. I'm delighted to do it. I love doing these live things and seeing all the comments and um, seeing people from around the world. I'm kind of still boggled by the internet and how cool it is. <laughs> It's so much fun um, getting to connect with everyone and being part of this global piano teaching community. I just think it's wonderful. So thank you so much for joining in. Becky says thank you as well. And welcome, Becky. It was wonderful to have you here. I will see you in the inner circle, right? Um, Clara, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Clara, for showing up. It was wonderful to have you here. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I think she was just finishing that comment. Uh, Rachel, thank you, Nicola. Great stuff. You're welcome, Rachel. 
fantastic to have you here. I am going to just write in the chat for those who need it. Um, so coupon code is head desk, just in case you want to copy that and then um, freebie. I'm just going to put in the URL for those of you who are in the live chat so that I can leave it open uh, for a few more minutes here and you can grab that um, without typing it in. Who likes typing, eh? Boring. So you can copy either of those across now um, and that should be nice and easy for you. I am going to switch back to my face. So let's just do that. Okay, that's me. Okay, everyone, I hope you had a great time. I certainly did. I really enjoyed chatting with you today. And I hope you um, got a lot of great ideas out of this. I really love chatting to teachers in this way and preparing the presentations. Obviously, it's a lot of work, but I really enjoy doing it and it improves my own teaching as well because it um, reminds me of ideas that, oh, yeah, I used to do it that way and I stopped. Why? Um, so I really hope you got some great ideas out of it and I certainly enjoyed putting it together for you. If you have any more questions, write them quickly in the comments. I'll leave it open for another second. Um, my students are just saying hi. I'm not sure if that's actually my student or if it's uh, the parent. Anyway, um, so any more questions? I'll give you just a couple more minutes to ask them. Otherwise, absolutely find me in the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers Community on Facebook. Just search Facebook for Vibrant Music Studio Teachers. Or if you just search for music teachers, you should see it as one of the options and it'll be the colorful logo so you'll recognize it as being me, because color. Um, uh, you can find me on colorfulkeys.ie. That's colorful with two U's because I'm from Ireland. You can find me at pianophysician.com. That's where the course is and there's links to the handbook and all that good stuff there. You can also find me on Facebook, Colorful Keys um or me myself on youtube on pinterest on instagram everywhere that you find people i'm there i'm happy to answer questions and if you have questions about the course uh, email me or facebook message me is the best way to reach me um facebook message my page colorful keys or write in the vibrant music studio teachers community on facebook um that's generally the fastest place to find me, really. But if you want a private message me, please do it at Colourful Keys, because I'll get that straight away. Um, and what else was I going to say? Or email me, and I'll make sure to answer you today if you want to use that coupon code. So email me nice and quick, and I'll answer you back as quickly as I possibly can between students and stuff like that, so that um, you get your answers, your questions answered, before purchasing. If there's anything you need to know, I'm an open book. I don't want you to purchase it and then go, this isn't what I thought it was. So please ask me, I'm happy to answer. And um, I look forward to connect with you, with you. I'm happy to chat about anything really. So just email me or message me. Uh, What's that on the top shelf? I think she means this one, which isn't actually the top. Uh, that there, I think is what she's talking about, the yellow. That is an art print that's actually was a birthday present from, no, Christmas present years ago from one of my brothers. And I keep it in my office because I think it's really sweet and it's bright and cheerful. And I like the pop of the yellow against the pink shelves. Super fun. And um, Clara Park, you can see my students' files. Yes, this is how I keep my students organized. So this is business. This is students, if you're interested. Each one has a folder. Okay, I'll take one out and show you if you like. So in here, she has a theory book because she does theory when she comes to her lesson, so I keep it for her. And then inside the folder, there'll be like assignment sheets and any worksheets that I'm planning on giving to that particular student. And they're organized by days. So that's Monday. I actually teach six days a week, so I don't have room for them all. 
and the Saturday students are kind of stuffed down the end. But it's the best I have for now. Um, and it's really easy to just go, oh, that would be perfect for Lily, for example. And I just pop it in there. So that's my simple organization system. Ah, girl, I've been collecting music picture books. That's why I asked. That's so interesting. I was working on a post about music uh, books for kids this morning. So if that's what you mean, like picture books for kids, um, I just published a page. So you might like that. If you search my Colorful Keys site for, um, even just search for piano parents should pop up recommended resources for piano parents or remind me in the Facebook group and I'll give you the link to that because I literally just put it together, especially for my piano parent, but also put it on the site for others. Yes, perfect. Well, I'll send you that link because those are I've been collecting them for my student library. So I started um, putting them up there so that parents can get them for their kids to use at home and stuff like that. Um, you got all your students files like that too. It's the best way because you can keep everything organized. I know some people use an accordion file, but I can't really see what I'm doing that way. Clara, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Happy to tell you about my student files. So I'm going to say everything all the places you can find me once again, and then I'm going to sign off. Uh, it was great chatting with you all. So please go to colorfulkeys, to use, dot ie for Ireland, uh, slash blog for the teaching blog. Contact me there, email me there, um, and get all my details and stuff like that, and links to everywhere. Go to uh, facebook.com slash groups slash vibrant music studio teachers or search uh, Facebook for vibrant music studio or vibrant music teachers should pop up. Please join if you're not a member already. If you do join, remember to ask the, answer the questions, right? Because I don't let people in who don't answer the questions because it's a very little amount of effort and it makes it easier for me to figure out if you're really a teacher or if you're spam. So please answer the questions when you apply to join. You can also find me on Facebook as Colourful Keys. And you can find me on Instagram as Colourful Keys. YouTube using my name, Nicola Canton. Um, and Instagram, Colourful Keys. I just said that one. Twitter is what I didn't say, Colourful Keys. Colourful Keys everywhere. If you can't find me under that name, use my name, Nicola Canton. But YouTube is the only place where I'm that. And all this stuff is on pianophysician.com, which you should be on right now. So um, thank you so much for joining me. It was wonderful to have you here. And I look forward to chatting with you soon. Bye for now.